The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jason Bryant here talking with a man who has been with this program pretty much since the onset. Matter of fact, really been with uh, with my career really, 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 really early on in the days of the Bison Turf. One Mr. Cliff Fretwell from Compound Clothing and Apparel at cmpteamwear.com, among other things. Cliff is our favorite Georgian on the program. Welcome back, Cliff. It's it's not been that long since you showed up, but uh, welcome back nonetheless. I always appreciate getting to chop it up with you about uh, the state of wrestling and what you're up to. I, I, I like getting to follow you and what you're up to and, and how you've grown pretty much what you're, what, what you love doing. And it's, it's, it's cool to see guys in our industry, whether it's following a career path with their competition or it's following a career path, covering our sport and uh, um, using kind of these amazing technologies that are coming out to, to make a livelihood out of it. I think it's awesome, man. It's, it's cool. As, as cool as it is for you to kind of watch us grow from day one, it's been, it's been just as equally as cool to watch guys like you um, grow and grow in your sense. So it's uh, it's always a pleasure being on this show, man. I, I am humbled by the uh, the admiration there. It's I'm I, I'm going to sit here. You can't see. I'm going to I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit. And go thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Now you cover wrestling in a different way. You cover it in terms of the actual clothing people are wearing, the, the uniforms and the gear and compound has grown you know, consistently, consistently, consistency, uh, you know, the days of, of throat punching cats ever since the funny t-shirts and stuff, they're still there. Uh, the Wu Tang being one of the most popular ones with Ric Flair that, uh, may or may not, never mind. We won't even get into the, uh, the copyrights Just for that one. Full on feeling that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ixnay uh, yeah. on the on airplay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the dynamic of your company has changed and, you know, what's the evolution been like for compound down in Georgia, not just from a gear standpoint, but also with, with, with the wrestling club. So first off, legally, we only accept Bitcoin for the Wu-Tang shirts. So that's 100% dark web and it's legal. So that's <laughs> get that out of the way. Woo! Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been, it's always a learning experience, man. Just like you find out, found out through what you're doing and the connections and the networking that, that, that you're doing to grow um, your, your personal brand and, and your, you know, your, your media brand and, and wrestling, it's, it's always, you know, it's always, it's always a learning experience. And for us, it's been, you know, trying to expand and grow as much as we can within wrestling. Cause believe it or not, it's a much bigger piece of pie business wise than, than a lot of people would think from a team wear and retail standpoint. And, uh, um, not that I want to make this a rudest ad by any stretch, but, but they've, you know, they've proven that, that with real, you know, business backing and, and significant dollars, how big you can grow a brand in a short amount of time. And, you know, the competition with, with guys like that, for, for for me, it makes our industry more healthy and it makes me work harder. Um, and uh, believe it or not, I, I don't necessarily want to see those guys fail. I'm not a guy that wants to put everybody out of business. Um, I think competition in any industry is healthy. Um, and it, it, it constantly makes me evolve as, as not only a clothing company, but as a marketer and as somebody who's trying to not only grow just a, a clothing or a sportswear brand in a specific industry, um, uh, it, it also, you know, it also makes me take a step back and, and look at how we could grow outside of just wrestling. Um, but having people, you know, keeping us honest and trying to outgrow us on a daily basis and out innovate us on a daily basis is you know, is, is awesome because, I mean, you know how complacency works. So, you know, if you're the, if you're the top dog and, and you don't think anybody can touch you, you end up being blockbuster real quick when Netflix rolls around. So um, I, I think right now it's, it's probably wrestling wise, brand wise, sportswear wise. I know there's some companies that have kind of been in and out um, and you've seen some somewhat major players in, in recent years kind of fizzling out. But I think the, the new guys that are coming to the table, they're, they're hungry. And like I said, some of them have, you know, more money back in them and, and more innovative people back in them than others. And, and it's healthy. I'm, I'm excited about it. We've, we've continued to grow, but it, it's, it's been a great learning experience sometimes in the form of, of, of loss. 
of, of finances and sometimes just, you know, taking your hits and getting back up uh, it, it, with marketing efforts or, or things like that that we try to do. But it, it's fun, man. I love it. I enjoy it every day. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a cool process to be a part of. And, and obviously, full disclosure, Compound has been a, a short-time sponsor, a gear sponsor, pretty much for the last four years. And uh, the new shirts just came in. So if you're a patron of the program, and I've mentioned this on the back end of other shows, like a recent one with Matt Lindland, is uh, you hit a certain level of giving per month, and you get that, that T-shirt level. You also get to the hat level, the draft glass level, the, the digital program, the preview guide. Like, that stuff that's like, you know, you get all this stuff. It's not just like, oh, thank you. You get nothing out of it. You're getting high-quality stuff from Cliff with the, you know, compound crown right there you're good so uh it's brandable i'm wearing a compound hat right now i will say this for full disclosure too i'm wearing a rude shirt right now from the national wrestling hall of fame so uh with, with, with i'm gonna hang up and call you back <laughs> <laughs> but with, with 500 wrestling t-shirts they all i don't think you've got 500 different designs do you or at least i don't have them all no, yet. i i don't but i i do manage to wear a, a compound type of shirt each day regardless of what they smell like so um, <laughs> sometimes sometimes you just got to grab a dirty one out the closet for working practice the night before just to make sure you're repping your brand but uh um no nah, man it's been awesome like i said it's been awesome supporting you you know we, we talked about it quite a few times on the podcast before but you know just just like-minded wrestling people and and we're both growing in different industries but but we both got the forward thinking the progression and the, and the coverage of the sport in mind as as we grow as businesses in, in different areas. And uh, it's been cool to be a part of it, man. It really is. The, the, the small part that we do to support you, um, and, and you return that uh, in spades. So it's, it's been fun, man. One thing that you guys have done with Compound is not just on the gear side, but also with the wrestling club side, is the prevalence on, on social media, not just Instagram, uh, you know, and Snapchat. Facebook is kind of... You know, I think that's where grandmas and moms are hanging out now, even though I'm, I guess I'm in that, that I'm, I'm a dad. So apparently, uh, yeah, I'm boring on Facebook. It's pictures of my kids and links to my podcast. So, uh, but you know, you big guys have been really proactive in, in using Instagram with, with practice footage, Snapchat with, with rides, with your dogs to work. I mean, <laughs> these two mediums, I mean, you do an Instagram live, what are these two mediums really meant to not just Cliff Fretwell, the person, but you know, compound as a whole, whether it be wrestling or the gear side of things. Um, well, I mean, to me, my, my, my background was in 3d animation and design and then the dot com boom hit and I really got just got immersed in the web world right out of college. And then, you know, as, as social media and just the internet as a whole has evolved, you know, and I kind of mentioned this to you earlier, um, before we started, it, it, we're at the tip of the iceberg right now from, from where, the, the technology and the social media and, and the way to reach a target audience is being used with, in respect to wrestling. Um, and uh, there's so much more we can do. And, and, and a lot of people look at us as, I guess you would say, some type of innovator um, with growing a brand and <clears throat> using some of that social media to put our product out there. Um, you know, and it's, it's one of those things is you can have the best product in the world, whether it's coaching, whether it's uh, uh, clothing, whether it's, whether it's shoes it, it, and, and nobody know about it. And it's, it's worthless, right? It, it's, if you're trying to sell it, if you're trying to get it out there in people's hands. So, um, you know, one thing that I've done is continue to study all the trends, you know, and, and it, and it's work, you know, and I, I, I get quite a few people on a regular basis, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, whether it's a coach or a, a guy starting a club or people that follow us with it. We actually have a lot of BJJ and MMA guys follow a, a lot of our accounts. And uh, they're like, hey, you know, I want to grow my brand. What should I do? You know, and, and a lot of times I don't think people are prepared for what the answer is for that. And um, it, it, it's a lot of work. I mean, the, the it, being in practice mode and then remembering to shoot a bunch of footage or, or have a bunch of footage that a parent's shooting or another coach is shooting and then, come back and chop it and up and, and posting it on a regular basis. Like if, 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 if you, if you went to, if you started tomorrow and we're like, Hey, I have to post and, and, and you do a lot, you're on your own. But if you have to post three, four times a day on several different social media channels, like after about seven days, you're, you're, you're over it. You don't want to do it anymore. And a lot of people, I think underestimate the amount of work that it goes in to put content out there. Um, you know, and it's, it, you, you've watched it with, with, uh, media outlets like flow wrestling and you saw their regularity of what they post. Um, 
whether you like what they post or the, the, the tone or the vibe of what they post, there, there's media coming out, there's content coming out, and we're a content craving society right now, whether it's something we want to get mad and argue about or whether it's something we can appreciate and it's a, it's a learning, it's from a, a learning aspect. Um, so that's one thing that I've tried to do is, and uh, I, I got so many amazing people around me that I get to talk to on a regular basis that, that, that I, I definitely don't want to take, ever take for granted. But, but Frank Papalizio is one of the guys that I probably look up to as a, an event planner in our sport more than anything. And uh, me and him were talking yesterday because I'm, I'm going up to Journeyman this weekend. And I was like, you, you know what I've always respected about you more than anything? Um, and it's something that as I'm trying to get to your level, I appreciate even more and more that you set the standard for is he tries to add value in every aspect of whatever he's doing. And I think a lot of times we only want to add value in what we're good at or what we feel like we're strong at or what we feel like our main message should be. And, and when Frank promotes an event, he's trying to add value to the parents, the coaches, the athletes, the referees, the concession stand workers. Like his brain is wired to make sure there's value across the board for everybody. And then you can take that same mindset and you can say, okay, I'm going to put content out there. How do I add value for everybody across the board and all those markets on every platform? Well, that's a ton of work, right? Because Snapchat, you get 15 seconds. You know, Instagram, you get one minute. Instagram TV, you get 10 minutes. Facebook's a completely different market. As, as you mentioned, it's a more older market. Or well, does your content change for that market? So there's a ton of different tracks you can take. And it's not just a post on every single social media outlet, the same thing over and over again. Um, so that's one thing that I think that I kind of have my finger on the pulse and we've taken some of the things other people have done good with specific areas. And we've tried to apply that to what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, it, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, if you would have told me, you know, this time last year, we'd have been clipping over 50,000 followers on Instagram and, and shout out to PDH for, for being a, a complete animal and staying on top of that with the content. Um, uh, it, it's huge for us and it's huge for our business too. I mean, we probably 50 camps a year. So, you know, that's kind of put us in the forefront of, of coming out and doing technique with a lot of people in a lot of places around the country. But we're also looked at as, hey, these guys aren't just guys running practice. These guys are innovators in the sport. They're technicians. They think about training cycles. They're mentoring kids. I mean, it's, it's a total package. And then, you know, once we're, once we're seen as wrestling people, it's easy to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, I'm with Compound Sports where, you know, we want your business. And like, holy smokes, I'm on your guys' Instagram. I didn't even think about buying my gear from you guys. You got my business. You know, so things like that where you're cross-promoting and, and, and being able to close deals or, or just grow a, a, a brand in an industry where there's not a ton of heavy hitters has um, uh, it, been, it's been fun, but it, it's a decent chunk of work. I mean, it really is. Yeah, one thing I remember having a conversation with Joe Williamson a couple of years ago when he was breaking into to to work in a, the social media. This is even really before Instagram really blew up, and you know he's like, Jason, you know what's the social media thing? And one thing I told him immediately, and this is something that I've, I I do some auto posting with some old stuff, uh, you know, I you know I drip campaigns to uh, missing letter where sure. you know, some of these shows will be one, three, seven, fourteen days out, but the vast majority. I found the success of social media is never, it's not auto posting and cross posting everywhere. Yes, I do post an Instagram to my Facebook, maybe my Twitter, but the content has to be genuine. The content has to be authentic sure. because otherwise, if it's just a feed of just reposting links, nobody's, you're not getting brand recognition. You're just, you actually, if anything, you're getting the anti of that. You're getting people, oh, that's the spam site. So let me give you an example like the newsletter that I put out each day, every single day, curated news. It's not automated as, in terms of I'm not just saying, okay, run a script, pull all these stories. I'm, I'm finding each story. I'm reading each story. I'm clipping it like this is good enough to go in. Uh, this one, not so much. This one's behind a paywall. Can't put that one in. Uh, this one's a great story from India that, could, you know, and that is all there. And now could I auto post that stuff on the Matt Talk online account? Sure, I could, but it wouldn't be genuine. So uh, why, why would I do that? So that's one thing I know that you guys do very, very well is. You know, that's not something auto post. It's like, all right, let's let's do this, 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 and this. Now, there's nothing wrong with scheduling a post that's that's authentic. Right. I want to make sure that no, I'm not. And I, I'm not and I'm not arguing auto posting anything is is bad. What 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 I'm 
what I'm saying is is that you can get as granular as you want with it, right? So so you could you could take the beauty of Instagram is is I can take a one minute video and I can post it to Instagram, Facebook, and, and Twitter, and and that works. What that 100 percent works. You can schedule stuff, and I, I'll tell you, man. The more I dig into Facebook, um, the more I realize what an amazing platform Facebook is, just from their analytics, their marketing standpoint. I don't want to bore anybody listening with with that type of stuff. But the back end of Facebook, I think unless you've really dug into it on the level that I'm trying to understand marketing and analytics and how to get the right content to the right people, it would blow your mind the the, uh, the amazing technology that they have. And and as we progress into this next 10 years, you know, the people that aren't getting on board, even at a surface level, are going to be so far left behind. Um, so let me let me get way off topic, and this is going to be something that you're probably going to be like, I never in a million years would think that anybody on my show would bring this up. Um, legalization of marijuana is at a big, big news line right now. Everybody's talking about it, what state's going to be legal in. And, and believe it or not, I got some people that want to get into that industry when they – when they, when they legalize it in Georgia, if they legalize it in Georgia. And all these guys are talking about what I'm going to do when it's legal, okay? And you can apply that to anything. What am I going to do when this market's ready? Well, now, now you start doing stuff now that, that the, now to build your brand. So, like, my, my, my uh, advice with this would be start, start a blog on all the uses of it. Start a, start a blog or a, or a video uh, review of, of all the things that, medicinal, recreational, all of this stuff, you start you start gaining viewers. You start getting eyes and ears on you as an individual or you as a brand or you as an information source, right? So you don't you don't wait a year and then everybody runs to the start line and gets ready to take off. Now now the playing field is equal. Like what what do you do now to continue to to bring people to wherever you're trying to bring them? You're, you're basically you're basically fighting for everybody's attention, right? So you could start two years out, you could start a year out, um, start growing an audience, and then when it's time to actually break ground on the business, literally and figuratively, you already have an audience in your hand ready to ready to market to, ready to talk to, ready to uh, sell on whatever you're selling. Um, and I think a lot of times everybody's just kind of sitting around waiting for something to pop off. Like the, the answer is always now. The answer is always do it now. Uh, preload now. Gain an, gain an audience now for a business you're going to start in a year. There's always people that you can earn their trust and earn their attention and earn their loyalty. And, and, and think about this. Think about the places that you've been prior to doing your own thing. And it happens in a ton of industries, right? This guy will go work for Nabisco, and then he'll go work for Kraft Foods. And then he's like, you know what? I've got to figure this industry out. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do it on my own, and I'm going to take the best of everything I learned, but I'm going to put my spin on it. That's exactly what you did, right? You worked at some of the biggest media um, outlets in our industry, and you, you, you learned. You also looked and said, man, they do that pretty terrible. If I, if I was in charge, I would do it this way. <laughs> no comment. And then, and then, and then you started <laughs> saying, but, that, but that's the way it works, right? So, I mean, and, and, and let's be honest, and, I, and I've said this to a bunch of people, and if they don't want to hear it, then they can, whatever, but... I remember when you, and this isn't me stroking your ego off because you got me on the show. This is, this is fat. And, and, and anybody that's been around for more than, you know, a couple years in the sport will, will agree with me, whether they want to agree with me or not. The media coverage from a video level before you got to USA Wrestling was a business. And then I remember seeing the WordPress site with the, with the embedded YouTube videos. And it was like you couldn't really index them and they were unorganized. And then, like, as you pushed and as you pushed and as you pushed to get more stuff up there, you know, whether it was Gary Abbott interviewing somebody or whatever, you started to see USA Wrestling having to look over their shoulder and be like, okay, Flow Wrestling is covering our sport better than we're covering our sport. And that goes back to, hey, competition's healthy, which you're, you're kind of poking, poking and being a thorn in people's side of USA Wrestling to, to, to elevate that level of more content. And for wrestling kind of sitting over here being the kind of the industry leader in media content, pulled their level up. And, and, and now you, you see USA Wrestling, I mean, you, you see them starting to cover it more. Now they're, now, that, now they're creating partnerships with people that do stuff better than they do it, right? USA Wrestling is a governing body. They don't need to be a media company, but they do need to oh, be aware of the fact that covering their sport from a media perspective 
is extremely valuable to their market. So it, you've gone through a lot of those growing pains at different areas of, of the media industry, and now you've applied those to what you're doing, and you're constantly trying to innovate on what you're doing. A lot of people are like, well, it's a podcast. He just talks into a microphone and records a conversation with a guy and puts it up. There's not a lot of innovation in that. There might not be a lot of innovation in you actually recording the show, but there's a lot of innovation on in how you prepare for the show, the content you do have for the show, how you put the content out there, how you revisit the content, whether it's throwback stuff, which you're starting to see some of these other people um, uh, do a lot of throwback stuff, when it's rel relevant to what's going on in the world today. Maybe you had a podcast with somebody talking about the world championships two years ago when it was Lauren Burroughs talking about going away with JB to the World Championships, and you replay that, and you get record numbers on your podcast. That's you thinking from a marketing perspective to connect constantly with your audience. And the mindset that we have in our industry right now is still extremely stale when it comes to that, and it's because it's work. And a lot of people don't see it as, well, oh, well, you just post on Instagram. That's not that big of a deal. I'm coaching guys over here. I'm growing this, or I got, I got real work to do. Well, okay, you keep thinking that. But those Instagram posts that I put up connect with my audience, and I, I convert those guys to customers, whether they walk in my gym, whether they buy my retail, or whether they buy my team wear. So the people that think that that's a, a non-important thing, man, it's going to be a struggle for them to play catch up in, in the next five years when Instagram isn't the thing anymore and Snapchat isn't the thing anymore and, and voice is starting to take over and you got augmented reality, and you got you got artificial intelligence, and all these things are starting to be integrated with our social media that we have no clue what's going to be next. The guys that don't even think Instagram's valuable or Snapchat's valuable right now, man, that's going to be that's going to be a tough pill for them to swallow when they're so far behind. So, I mean, that's where my head's at, kind of on a daily basis. And you know, I, I wish I could do that full time. I wish I could just coach wrestling and then study social media and, and it's the marketing integration type stuff because that's what I geek out on. Um, that's not the world I'm living in yet. So I'm working hard so I could just do that full time, but still, still having to, uh, do, do, do some, uh, grinding on the pixels every now and then, which I, which I don't mind as much either. Yeah. As you say, pixel push. Now, one thing you did bring up, you brought up, well, what the site was, was the TV, And that was the site where I, here's what I discovered when I was at USA wrestling before I even implemented, uh, the streaming of all the events. We actually went away from live sports video, went to Ustream for a while, and then, uh, what you see on Flow Wrestling now really started with, with Adam Fenn giving me a call one day, going to Fargo, working with a TriCaster, and him going, we can do this better. And that's where the, the whole right. streaming engine blew up. I mean, it, it, was, it really came, I think it was, I want to say 2010, 2011, I was cutting video up from like an FLV file, um, not to get right. too inside baseball on people. But flash video. <laughs> people don't even know what Macromedia Flash is anymore. Yeah, well, I was cutting up, and then soon it became to Adam had built a server that I was just uploading. You know, it went from like, man, I, I cut up a thousand videos this week. It's the most we've ever done. To the next year, going, wow, we, we posted 9,000 matches. Like, and it wasn't even right. hard. I actually had time to go to the turf. And, and well, I've always had time to go to the turf. But going back to the Matt <laughs> TV, USA Wrestling at the time had an extensive video library that really wasn't being marketed. And I found it's something as simple as a plug-in. It was actually called Tube Press, which I actually told right. and, and, uh, Andrew, Andy Ross at 49 North about up in Canada. And, you know, basically to create a tube site. And that, that harnessed all these playlists. I'm like, wow. So then I'd find streams. And that really was there until the USOC overtook what you see the mat.com is now with, with a different uh, content management system. So eventually all that stuff went away, but it was like, okay, well, I'm just finding any stream I could and embedding it. I was Dave Matthews, another Georgia guy who now works with USA Russ. He's like, Hey, how can I embed this stream from the Oregon or how can I embed this stream from, right. from, from the, the German Bundesliga? So yeah. And I actually even remember going back to the intermat days, that very first interview with David Taylor in like 2006, he's like 98 pounds dripping wet wrestling, in the semifinals of the Beast of the East. And I'm like, man, that was, oof, we're talking super meta here with the discussion, but man, you know, the kid is, now he's just gigantic with his giant beard. And then he, I mean, he just, his ears were the same yeah. size then, but it was just, uh, you know, to see right. where it's come. Now, that, get, no, his ears are big. Yeah. His ears are bigger now. <laughs> Less about me, <laughs> more about the, the action here. Now, one of the things is, we, we see where, you know, Flow Wrestling's obviously been pushing the envelope and, and, and being on the cutting edge of, of social media, not just with their, their technologies and, and what they have brought to the table the last decade. But what do you think wrestling needs to do more of? I mean, who, who needs to do a better job in stepping up and be like, look, you've got content here. Let's promote it. I mean, let's even give United World Wrestling a little bit of a plug because they actually have been doing 
some positive stuff with the big move Monday with the YouTube videos and, and their, their, their yeah. social media presence. But what, where do you think the sport needs to grow as a whole? Where does it need to improve? Um, I mean, just, just engagement in general. Uh, I, here, here's the deal. And, and this is something, you know, back in the Blitz wrestling days when, when, when me and Don were, were trying to change the game when it came to sponsoring athletes and a lot of that type of stuff. And, and, and you've seen some of those guys, make an adjustment but engagement is something that's a different level than just content so i can post a video and it could be the coolest video on the planet and a lot of people can be asking questions about it or talking about it and the fact that that i don't engage with them whether it's me individually as a compound person or i'm actually engaging with them on the compound wrestling account um that's a that's a huge deal that's another layer of connecting with your audience. And that's why Twitter was so cool when it first came out is because you could actually see a conversation with two people. So if, you know, if, if, if Alex Rodriguez is having a conversation with another baseball player or whatever, you feel like you're sitting in the room talking with those guys. Right. And that's what was so cool about Twitter. It was, it was brief, but you could see everybody talking to everybody. And it was like this one big giant conversation, but it also was engagement. You got to see engagement. And I think what we did from that is we shifted to, okay, it's just a content-driven world, so just put it out there. And I could have 80 comments under it, but I'm not going to look at a single one of them. I'm not going to reply to a single one of them. But now you're starting to see guys like David. Um, you bring up David Taylor, and, and, and now he's, he's got a different brain. He's got a different brain about him because he's got a business. you know. And I, I talked to him a decent bit when he started opening his club, and I just pretty much told him how he went about it and what to do with it. He already had it again. He had an established brand. He had a market that was already there waiting for him. You know what I'm saying? So whether he went out and created it by doing camps and having kids fall in love with him or whether he went out and won a couple of Hodge trophies and he had a huge fan base in that same area that was going to come knocking as soon as he opened his doors, he kind of preloaded his audience. Um, but one thing that he didn't do a lot of when he was fresh out of college was he would post a decent bit, but he would never engage with his fan, fan base. You know what I'm saying? If you go look at his Instagram account now, he's posting techniques, he's posting practice videos, he's posting motivational things. And then if you look below, he's actually commenting back every now and then. And that's huge. That's huge for like a wrestling coach to be like, hey, so what if the guy rolls this way? And it's a technique video that David put up about a wrist kill. And then he replies to that coach. Even though that coach was already in love with David to begin with and respected him at the highest level, he engages with that coach you create another level of connection with your fans, with your potential camp goers, with guys that are going to buy the apparel of the company that sponsors you. And there's all these layers of things that engaging with an audience as opposed to just putting content out there is, is something that people do all this work. Okay, I did the content. Cliff said, go do the content. This expert in the industry, I'm not talking about me, but this expert in the industry on a YouTube video said, you got to put up content every day. Okay, I went and did that. Is that enough? No, that's not enough. The answer is always going to be, you got to do more. And engagement is something that we got to do next. Now, you talked about UWW, and it was something, of course, Roper is going to come up if I'm on a, a call with you, but it was something that Roper approached me about a while back. And he was like, hey, you know Foley pretty well. He was like, why don't we contact Foley and ask them what the price would be if they gave us all the archives of all the video footage that they've had forever, which they have, it's sitting on hard drives in an office somewhere. Hopefully they're not ruined and we'll splice it up. We'll label it. We'll put it on a YouTube channel and then they can just have it. Our, our work to split it all up and label it and upload it would basically be payment for them having it all cataloged. Um, and we actually talked to Foley for a while and got close to getting a certain amount of video, but it was to the point to where it was so far back and we weren't going to be, a, it was like a five or six year trailing thing. So we would always be like six to eight years behind on like new content, which I get for streaming rights and stuff like that. But it was just like, ah, I don't know how many people are going to watch like the 1967, you know, 52 kilo quarterfinal match is it worth us going through and digging all that up and and, and doing it for us yeah because we're wrestling junkies but for the masses no and our, our our motivation behind that was to grow a youtube channel right to get thousands and thousands of worldwide people coming to a youtube channel then you can convert them to whatever you want then you can put up whatever content you want branded for 
your business or your camp system or whatever you're trying to do. But again, you got content, you pull in that audience, then you can market to that audience. But um, I think UWW has done a great job because they only had uh, up to go yeah. because it was so bad. <laughs> um, but but again, you know, and, and you either hate Foley or you love Foley, but at the end of the day, the dude loves wrestling and he's engaged um, on, a, on a pretty high level with, with the industry. And they're working hard to get stuff out there. And they're trying to bring wrestling networks and people together. And I get there's contracts and streaming rights and politics and all that involved when it comes to a lot of that stuff. But I think overall, they've done a decent job, um, especially with it being worldwide and having to engage with the audience worldwide. But again, it can't be always eight hour a week and this guy's an intern or whatever like if they really want to blow that thing up they either need to partner with uh uh, uh i don't want to say a streaming media company like flow because it would be a kind of a conflict of interest to grow another media outlet but but they need full-time resources that understand all of that and they can put it up in different languages and it can tie it into different uh, events and storylines and things like that. I think right now they're doing a lot of surface level stuff, which is great, and, and it's and it's grown quick because it's worldwide. Like Flow Wrestling, and, and you are primarily domestically media outlets, you know, trying to draw a domestic audience. I mean, these guys are drawing people from around the world. Well, you know, your 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 bucket of uh, of people that you're you're trying to draw in just got a thousand times bigger, but you're still kind of doing this surface level marketing and content promotion. So um, they, they could do a lot more in terms of that, but they got to get some dedicated resources. It's only working on that. And I, again, I don't think they realize the value of what all that work or all that money would cost to do that would in turn improve their product. But again, I don't know what their business model is. I don't know what their blueprint is to grow UWW brand to grow viewership. I don't know if they get a kickback from the amount of people that tune into these live streams that they got through track wrestling right now. I don't know. And usually money's the motivator in a lot of aspects. So if, if they're, if they're fat and happy right now, then I would expect them to go above and beyond. But what they've done to this point, I think it's, I think it's good. You know, I think it's good, but I mean, there's, that you can always do more. There, the, you know, it's always going to be more and more and more. Um, I think they need to engage with the audience more. I, I really do. Um, so, I mean, it, there's just, there's just so much out there, man. I could talk for hours and hours on, on integration and, and things like that and bore people to death. But it, I mean, it's, it's an exciting time right now for any sports industry. Um, but I, I, I still think that a lot of our, our pro athletes and our sport and a lot of even media companies in our sport and, and then, uh, brands in our sport, uh, are, are just, are just far behind on a lot of it. And, and there's blueprints for it. You know, there's blueprints for it and people just aren't following it and they're not even trying, you know, and, and, and don't tell me you can't, don't tell me you can't figure it out. You know, you can Google anything. You can pretty much figure out how to do any, I, I figured out how to code an Excel spreadsheet algorithm the other day on YouTube and I'm dumb as a box of rocks. I just put up a YouTube video and listen to what the guy said. So you learn how to do anything. Um, but, uh, we're getting there, man. We're getting there. Well, one thing I, I do say is I know that Eric Olinowski has been working with him full time. And granted, the one thing I think that with the social media, one thing you brought up was good is about the other languages, because uh, we were discussing in Trinava, there were some claims about complaints from uh, about the UWW social. It's like, well, why are you only showing Americans? Well, and then Eric's like, dude, we get this complaint. If we show a Russian, we get people going, why are you only showing Russians? If you get an Iranian, why are you only showing Iranian? I mean, it's like you can't make anybody. It's like, you know. Uh, Mitch Hedberg What do you said, mean by your only showing? Yeah. What do that, you mean by your only showing? That's like, oh, well, why do you why do you focus so much on the Americans? Why do you focus so much on the Russians? Why do you focus so much on, on the Iranians? On their social media? Yeah, or, yeah. Or Anytime they do a feature, it's like you've got, wow. you know, it's like Penn State fans complaining about when somebody does something a lot about Iowa or vice versa or right. any of the power programs get some pub. People, well, well you know, they're focused on Penn State. Well, they're focused on Iowa. They're focused on Oklahoma State. Yeah. It, it's part of that. So, and, and one thing, I think the, the, the language aspect is good because one thing we found out with these Twitter polls too is like, you know, who is, who's going to win? And the Iranians on Twitter were complaining. It's like, we don't have Twitter in Iran. We're huge on Instagram. So, you know, platforms right. that, that are big. I mean, in, chi- in China, I think it was QQ or something like that is their version of Facebook or something along those right. lines. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, or uh, there's, there's a social network in China. I don't know. I've never been to the People's Republic of China to even 
analyze it, but like in I Russia, it's, it's VK. Think, yeah, I think it's MySpace. I think it's MySpace. Oh, dude, don't even uh, my, my MySpace. <laughs> my my MySpace. To quote Weird Al, my MySpace page was totally pimped out. I didn't even. I was yeah. like, I, I kept top eight, even though you could go to like sixteen at one time. I so. never, believe it or not, I never have MySpace. But hey, so here's the deal. If somebody complains about, and this is the world we're living in, I get it. People just they're they're hardwired to complain. But I don't, I don't, I don't post what what I like. I post what's relevant. And and if your if your mission statement for your or your core values or whatever you outline as a blueprint for your social media growth, that's what you stick to, right? So like if 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 NCAAs are leading up your storylines and the people you're interviewing on your podcast and, and, and the other podcasts that you're doing on your network, they're talking about this, talking about conference tournaments and seeding and leading up to the NCAA tournament. You, you talk about what's relative, right? So in that aspect, it, yeah, you're, you're keeping your finger on the pulse of the, what the people are commenting and what they're saying um, and you're engaging with them. But, but if you're putting up relative content of what's going on in the world right now then, or what's going on in the industry or the sport or whatever, then, then that's what's going on. Um, I, I do think that, again, there's a bunch of different versions of some of these social media platforms that are very niche for other countries. Mm-hmm. Again, if that was somebody's full-time job and they had, they had that all, all that stuff laid out and they were making sure they were getting that content in those right formats and those areas, um, that, that's huge. But again, there's only so many hours in the week to A, find the content, post the content, engage with the content, um, innovate where you're putting it why you're putting it where and who you're trying to target when you're putting it there, you know, that, that's, that's a lot of hours. That's a lot of work to do. You know, and again, they, they got to lay it next down to and say, okay, this is worth the value that we're going to pay for it because we're trying to achieve X. And right now we're, we're way behind and we're never going to get ahead until it's a team's full-time job to do it. You know, just like if you decided tomorrow, Hey, I'm not going to take the, I'm not just going to do a podcast anymore. I'm going to start doing a vlog. And I'm going to start doing a, a a day in the life, and I'm going to start doing a, uh, a, a a showcase piece on one individual a week. Um, what you already do is is pretty busy, right? You got a pretty fun, it was tough for us to even get on the same page because you got stuff you got to go do today. But at that point, the value of adding a team. So I'm going to have a guy following me around with a camera doing a day in the life at JB. And then they're going to chop that up each day. And every other day, we're going to post a, a, a blog post of, of what I'm doing in my life because people want to know what I'm doing and how I'm covering the sport. Then I'm going to pick one athlete a week that I'm going to have on an a, a, a interview or another podcast or whatever. I'm going to call it X. And it's going to be my spotlight athlete of the week because I want to draw more fans in that are fans of that specific athlete, not just the guys that want to listen to some of these generic podcasts that I'm doing with other various industry people. And then you're starting to get granular with who you're trying to draw into your network. But again, all these people are coming to your network. They're coming for different reasons. So I might be coming because you're interviewing Jacob Casper and I'm a huge Jacob Casper fan. You're only talking to that guy for that amount of time. And you're talking soup to nuts on, on his whole life and what he's got going on. Well, you're drawing those guys in, but then you're coming back and you're interviewing some of these uh, Stan Desi type guy to talk about the politics of, of what's going on in the international scene. And, and maybe that's, that's a market that nobody that's a Jacob Casper fan would ever tune in to listen to. You know what I'm saying? So like with all of that stuff, Jason Bryant couldn't do by himself. You would have to start pulling people in, but if your viewership and your listenership went up 10, 20 fold and your ad revenue went up 10, 20 fold, then, then, it, then it makes sense to do it. You know, but a lot, a lot of people, don't want to build that framework or even take the risk to do it um, because they don't see the value in it immediately. They don't see the return in it. A lot of this social media growth and stuff, it's not something that comes back immediately. You get that audience and it takes a year to get that audience. Then when you start marketing that audience, it's like, holy smokes, man, our ad revenue went through the roof last month because we spent a year building this. We spent $100,000 $100,000 on a team and all this content and did all this stuff. Now I got more fans than I've ever had. I got more listeners than I've ever had. Now I can, I can make one post on Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or mention in my podcast. And 40% of those people do exactly what I say. They go subscribe to this. They go buy this. They go, they go do whatever. You know what I'm saying? Now you're building your audience. You, you put more effort into creating 
other media streams and revenue, or, and, and which in turn is going to be revenue. You know, that's scary to do with social media right now because people want to see if I put this thing on eBay and a guy buys it, I get the money immediately. Where if you told it, hey, JP, if you went and put 100 items on eBay tomorrow and you sold all 100 items in a week, you're not going to get paid on those items for a year. Well, that's scary as hell, right? Well, that's kind of where social media is at right now. A lot of people are still a little iffy about it because it's not it's not all up on the it's not all on the front end. Um, so I think once people start wrapping their heads around that and they're more patient, that's the whole thing is just patience in general right now. We want it now, instant gratification society. So um, the more patient people start getting about how they're growing. Um, their audience, especially on social media platforms, I think I think you'll see a lot more people buying into it, uh, not only long term, but more monetarily, you know, um, and, and it's, it's been so easy to track, man. I can see how many people I'm getting by the minute, you know, analytics on Facebook and, and Instagram is insane, the amount of information I get uh, on these accounts about people that are watching our stuff and clicking around. It's crazy. Now, one thing that also you, you talk about the ad revenue, that's one thing I think we in wrestling, and this has been kind of my, uh, it's been kind of a pet peeve. I don't know if pet peeve is even the right term, but kind of something, that, a burr under the saddle perhaps, or any anecdote or metaphor or simile you want to throw out there is sometimes I feel like people in wrestling don't really understand the value of what we have. And the reason I say that you bring up ad revenue is when, when negotiating an ad contract, I found so many times, and this goes back to my time with Intermat and the NWCA, when you've got, you know, you've got people complaining about the, the cost of flow wrestling. Well, back then, you had people complaining about the $3.25 a month that was for Intermat's premium service. And at the time, I was putting out stuff that nobody was getting elsewhere. I mean, it was, there, was, there was high-quality stuff going there, and it was basically the cost of, uh, you know, at the time, uh, Starbucks coffee, a pack of cigarettes, a can of chew, you know, a couple sodas. I mean, it was it was cheap, and we had people complaining about it. So when we get you talk about ad revenue, do we need to try to get our sport outside of the bubble of just the Asics, the Nikes, the the Cliff Keens because they get hit up constantly. It's like it, you can't go do something in wrestling without oh well well let's go to Asics to get money, let's go to Cliff Keen to get money, let's go to now Nike to get money, let's go to you know brute adidas or whatever it used to be or brute wrestling or you know all these it's the same brands that keep getting hit up over and over and over and over again and the fact that we don't really put uh, we want everything to be free in our sport so we don't really have a whole value system of how much this is actually worth in the open market what have you seen that say something that you know this podcast for example and i'm not using this as a pitch but i'm saying outside of this the the, the traffic that this show gets in the open market, in some places, if this was about, you know, this was about tech, if this was about something, uh, you know, if this was like a serial podcast or, or something like Joe Rogan, you're getting thousands and thousands of dollars per episode. I get people pulling teeth if, you know, well, how much do you, you know, want? And I say a number is like, well, that's that's what I was like. Yeah. You, so you want to sponsor the show for 12 for twelve dollars an episode? Do, and, you know, it's there forever. So. Uh, what do you think we need to do with the, in terms of educating the wrestling community on the value of what we have? No, not everything can be free, folks. There is, but you got if it's not worth paying for, <laughs> if it's not worth paying for, is it actually worth anything? Um. Well, you got those guys that are sipping the seven dollar and twenty eight cent latte in traffic. You know, tweeting about how they don't want to pay. You know, one hundred and ten bucks a year for a live video subscription to track or flow or, or, or whatever it is. And, and it, it, those people are those people. Um, there's a limited amount of money in the sport of wrestling. Um, and unfortunately for us, we, we've kind of gone down two paths, I think. And I'm just shooting from the hip here, and I'm sure somebody will destroy me um, in a comment section somewhere and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. But this is just the way I kind of look at it. We've got we've got the super rich guys. We've got the Novogratz, the bars, the moratories. We've got the guys that have just dumped senseless, not senseless, but endless amounts of uh, Bardis, guy like that, dude, that are, that are 100 millionaires, billionaires, whatever, that are just going to dump money in. So uh, X part of wrestling, whether it's an RTC or, or incentive programs or whatever, to, to make wrestling be more sustainable from our pro level and for our RTC level and for the beyond prep level because they can't necessarily give that money to amateur athletes. Um, and 
those guys are just giving money away. They're not looking for any type of return. It's not an investment for them, right? So they're writing that off on their ridiculous tax statement at the end of the year, okay? So that money, a lot of times, it could be big money in our sport to go to your podcast to do any of that would just be philanthropy, right? Because, like, I, I know Andy Bart's riches all get out, but I have no clue what business he's in. He could have a, a, a maid cleaning service that's worth a billion dollars, and I don't know. I don't even know what kind of business he's in. But, again, for him to stroke a fat check and actually care about the check that he's stroking and you to add value for the check that he's writing you, um, there's got to be a return, right? So the people that are sponsoring Matt Talk Podcast, what is my return if – JB, if I give you all this merchandise year round to give to your patrons and this, that, and the other, and my, well, with me, I'm not getting tons and tons of teamware deals, even though I do get some, I, I do. And, I, and, and that's part of the reason why we do it. But for me, it's brand recognition, right? It's tagged on social media. People are wearing the shirts. You're talking about them. They know you're a compound sportswear, CMP sportswear guy. So I do that from a brand recognition standpoint. Um, again, some of this is closed-minded thinking from industries in our sport that are old school is they don't, they don't value brand recognition. So it's like, look, JB, if I give you a check for $1,000 or $12,000, that's $1,000 a month to sponsor your podcast, I have to get at least 15 to 20 grand back on that investment every year or I'm not going to do it. And I mean dollars. So I'm a transmission rebuilding service. I'm going to give you 12 grand a year. I expect 15 to 20 grand in transmission rebuild services to come directly from your podcast advertising. Well, probably not going to happen. Even if you went to Resolite and, and did a deal with them, it doesn't always equate dollars and cents in that aspect. However, you can, if you're a smart businessman, have a click funnel or a lead generation page or an affiliate code or something like that that people can use to go to Resolite or to go whoever sponsored your show so they can actually track that. And that's on you as the guy looking for sponsorship to say, hey, here's my affiliate program or here's my referral program. And then, hey, let's do a trial run. Let's do one year. And then after that, we'll start six months and 90 days and we'll sit down and re-up it if, if it's created value for you. Now, this is only going to be dollars and cents, but I'm also going to add brand value to you as well. But if I just stroke you the check and then I sit back and cross my legs and I'm not retweeting your stuff or putting promotions in line with it. Hey, JB, you got a show coming up this Wednesday. Who's it, who's going to be on it? Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to run a cross promotion on my social media, advertising your show to get viewers to your show, but I'm also going to kind of use your brand and who you're having on your show for some content on my social media. It works both ways in that aspect. But again, we're still in the mindset of I'm going to give you a check and I expect at least, if not more than that in return. Um, and, and that's tough because we're a limited amount of money in our industry and the big money in our industry are guys that are just kind of flushing it down the drain on their tax return anyways. And you're right, the Nikes, the Asics, and, and some of these other big brands get hit up, but you'd be shocked as a guy on the other end of the uh, industry, not so much asking for money as giving it. I get hit up all the time for all different types of stuff, but you'd be surprised if, how much like people think it legitimizes their tournament if they just have an A6 banner hanging and, and they say it's the A6 takedown classic or whatever. Um, and uh, they think it legitimizes their event and they're not getting any money from it, but A6 is kind of getting some pub from it. But again, nobody's on the same page together. They're just hanging up a banner and A6 is just sending them a banner or giving them a thumbs up to print a banner locally. But that's nothing for anybody. You know what I'm saying? There's really no marketing or growth or value added behind any of what either one of those parties are doing. Um, it's not getting any more. Nobody's signing up because, oh, this is sponsored by ASIC. Now I'm going to take my son to this tournament on the weekend. So, again, the, the uninnovative level that we think we want to not add value when we ask somebody for their money or somebody gives us their money, it's a two-way street. And a lot of people think it's a two-way street. And, and it goes back to kind of what I was talking about, about Frank Pop. And, and the way he thinks about stuff is when he goes and sits down with a sponsor, or I go sit down with a sponsor, like, I'm trying to build a new wrestling facility for our wrestling club. Well, I spent a significant amount of time down in Daytona talking to Resolite, and I'm like, look, we've got the biggest wrestling social media footprint out there, period. Don't look at anybody's social media. We post more. We have more engagement. 
imagine if Resolite was heavily branded in my wrestling room and all these videos were going up and your logo was in the background on a regular basis. So I put some stuff up on Snapchat. You probably saw it just on my story, just on my Snapchat story and my Instagram story. Benny Barber hits me up, but not even, not even an hour later. Hey, why not Dollar? Let's talk. You understand what I'm saying? So like those types of things, certain people in the industry understand the value of it. Well, I, I'm, I'm open. I, I like, the softness of Resolite. I don't know if I could, my old bones could train on a, a, a dollar every day. But again, <laughs> at the end of the day, that's what I was talking to Vinny about yesterday. And I was like, look, man, let, let's talk. You know, I, I want a brand that's involved with us that wants to be involved with us. It's not just going to give us mats or I'm just asking for free stuff because I've already done all this stuff. I don't want free stuff because I've already done all this stuff. I want, I want a good deal that works for my brand. And I want a good deal that works for your brand. And then we're going to continue to work beyond that. It's not just give me this and walk away. Um, so, uh, and, and you saw Izzy, Izzy Martinez did. I don't know what the deals of that term was. And he might have paid full price for him. And he's just a nice guy. But my, my guess is, and I know Izzy, he stroked a deal with, with those guys. And he, he has a lot of eyeballs on him. He's, it's Martini Catholic. It's Izzy Martinez. It's, it's a ton of the best guys in the country. You know what I'm saying? So you've leveraged part of that to, hey, I want to make my new room look good. Give me some mats. Cut me a deal on some mats. But then beyond that, I'm going to add value as the guy you sponsored to shoot these videos on a weekly basis, whether it's training videos, whether it's technique videos. We're going to tag you in our social media. We're going to work with you on campaigns. We're going to try to drive traffic to, to what you're doing. We're going to be long-term. If you give me my mats for my room, all the C3 events I'm going to do, the college combines around the country are always going to be sponsored by by Resolite or, or, or whatever. And then I go stroke a deal with, with uh, Defense Soap to make sure our mats are clean, our, our Resolite mats are cleaned by Defense Soap at every C3 event. You start building that brand loyalty at specific events over time. I'm adding value. They're using that value that I'm adding off the stuff they gave me to grow their, to grow their presence in the sport based off of the platform and the audience that we engage and continue to build. It works. It works. It 100% works. It, look at NASCAR. Look at how many people that weren't a NASCAR fan because they didn't have a Nextel phone. Like, I guarantee you there were, there were toothless guys in a pickup truck that probably went and spent money on a Nextel phone that didn't have money to spend on a Nextel phone because they were that diehard of a, of a, a NASCAR fan. And it was sponsored by Nextel and doggone, and I'm not going to not have a Nextel phone and be a NASCAR fan. You know what I'm saying? And that's a stretch, and that's at a high level. But again, that's the way our world works, you know, but it's not, a, it's not a one-way street. And, uh, and, and you can take a bunch of different tones with it, but you, you as, a, as a podcast guy can't come to anybody and say, hey, I got this audience. You're going to reach this many people. Give me X amount of dollars, and then we're done. It, 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 never, it never should work that way. You know, you should go to them with a value plan. And then also, if I were you, I would have a little – a little two, three, four point thing at the, at the bottom of that to be like, hey, and this is what I suggest you guys do in conjunction to the value I'm going to add. You know what I'm saying? And give them ideas. That way you're not only adding value what you're going to do on your platform, you're giving them ideas who probably aren't social media wizards to do some small things in conjunction with what you're doing to have double the amount of value. Then they walk away from the meeting and be like, dude, man, I was, I was thinking 12 grand was a lot. Now I'm not thinking it's enough, you know? But, I mean, you got to start somewhere, and, and it's not just handout, right? We're still a handout sport, and, and it, it just blows my mind. It, it literally blows my mind how we're still a handout sport. I just I don't get it. There, there's tons of value that people can create in our sport, and there's a lot of money floating around. It ain't, it ain't, uh, it ain't the NBA by any stretch, um, but uh, people can be a lot more innovative in the way they're trying to grow right now. They really can. One thing you talk about – the the money things and now we're getting to the situation where guys that are at are our age that are they're starting to become the people that have money in there that we're coming coaches we're we're the, we're the people that are making the decisions on all right where's our school going to buy our next mat it's no longer the you know the our six year old coaches are are no longer six years old they're 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 eighty eighty five years old now I mean we've been we've been out of school that long so the people making decisions are getting younger and younger or less they're they're actually growing with the, the platforms so when, right. You know, whereas, you know, an ad in Amateur Wrestling News or Win Magazine used to carry a lot more clout with people looking to buy wrestling mats. Let's, let's, let's stick with Reslite as an example. 
uh, then then now you're you, you're looking for social, and then some places are like, well, I'm I'm advertising here, but I'm not getting an ROI. Well, that's not where people are looking to people that already have these contracts are already they're reading this already. So you know, some people are throwing it air because it's the way they've always done it, and some people are like, well, sure. no, they're they're using social media for as you said engagement. It's like okay, you know, 15 years ago. If there's no social media, does does compound even really? Ha- I mean, how hard are you working to try to get a foothold into the market with with Win Magazine, Intermat, and Amateur Wrestling News even before Flow? Oh yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a totally different world, and I'll be honest with you, I don't even know if I can answer that question because I can't imagine my world without it. I would I. And believe it or not, the first startup I worked at was actually uh, one of the lasting startups in Atlanta. I think the last time I checked, it was like five or six from like the heyday internet startups when people were just getting $36 million VC checks and nobody was really making anything. We were just all kind of hanging out, making cool stuff, but there was no real model to make something. There was a company called Avienda at the time, and they were email delivery service. Basically what MailChimp is now, believe it or not, I got a crazy story. I designed the first user interface for MailChimp way back in the day. This guy named Dan Kersius, who's one of the owners. Um, I just had a friend through a friend, which is a, a funny story I'll tell you sometime. But it was cool back in the heyday when all these internet startups were coming up and MailChimp's one of them. Avienda, which is now Silverpop, was a company that I was working for and it was email delivery. And like my job and my team's job that I was on was to figure out how to embed a video in an email. Like, that's how hard it was back then to just deliver a video, a video link, or a picture in an email without getting stripped out by email clients. And it's hard for people to wrap their heads around. But now they're one of the major B2B email delivery platforms. Like, I think UPS uses, when you ship something and you get an email notification, like, UPS uses their email delivery platform, Silver Pops. So, like, there's a lot of industries out there like that. Um, that were getting big bucks back in the day to like develop random technologies. And, 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 and the problem with that is, is like none of the social media really existed back then. So it was all email delivery. And I, I probably would be real, real, real hard on email. I still do a ton of email campaigning right now because A, it's easy to track and B, I, 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 I get a lot of results with it. Um, to me, um, where I'm headed next, with, with some of this stuff is uh, starting to integrate my email campaigns and stuff with a lot of the back-end technology that Facebook has. So, um, and I, I don't want to bore people with it, but like you can start taking your target list and MailChimp or whatever you're marketing with and actually use them through Facebook to pull all these people's profiles to the forefront of your banner ads. Um, and there's just a ton of new technology out there to do that. Um, but there again, you got, Greg Urbis isn't Snapchatting the St. Ed's practice. You feel me? <laughs> like that that ain't happening, right? And and that that's to your point, but what what has Greg Urbis done? He's he's brought in young blood, not only to coach the team and, and to do the stuff that he can at his age, and I'm sure you know the stat, it's like eight hundred million years they've had an all American every year at the NCAA tournament. And that's a testament to what that consistency has been with him and his coaching staff and what he's done over the years. Um, you will see some of those things starting to emerge more and more as the older guys, and, and I'm not saying Barry Davis is old, but you see how, you know, Barry goes out and then you got Bono and Reader coming in and then those guys get it. Those guys get it. You know, whether, whether, whether Bono is, is killing it on his Snapchat or his Instagram, or whatever, he's on there. I see it. He's posting on a story. You see Reader posting motivational stuff on Twitter every day. You see a lot of people retweeting it and engaging with it. They're, 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 they're understanding that their prevalence on those platforms is important. And that second wave is coming through. But again, you can't just put content out there. You got to put content that means something. You got to put content that resonates with the guys that you're putting it out there for. And then you got to engage with it. Um, and it was something, it, it's crazy that, that uh, we're, we're linked up here, but I was actually talking to Kevin Ward this morning. I don't know if you saw the video yet, but it was a gear day thing. They posted a video about gear day at Army. And, and I, I started to tweet about it, and I knew it would come off wrong. So I just, I just reached out to Coach Ward, and I said, look, dude, I just – and he's got a couple of our guys up there, um, Paul Robinson and, and, and Owen Brown, and might be having a couple more coming pretty soon. But I said, look, dude, uh, 
I didn't, I didn't tweet this because I didn't want it to come off wrong, but you have done an unbelievable job of making a service academy not feel like a service academy. And, 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 the, and, the, and the, the stigma with that is, is like me, I would have never gone to a service academy because I don't want to cut my hair and, and dress up in a, a, a thing and go to PT and have all this, this, this kind of lined up stuff for me every day. You're like worried about your hair, Cliff? You, you don't have any yeah. anymore. <laughs> Back then, I still didn't have any hair. You're right. So, but like, I like a little bit of chaos in my life. So, like, a service academy wouldn't appeal to me. But what they've done is they've made it be cool to go to the service academy, and they've also put out relative content that says, "Look, we are a service academy, but we have a ton of personality on these teams. We have a ton of personality in this room on our coaching staff. We can let our collars down. We can have some fun. It's not all marching formations." And being in and it lights out by nine o'clock and bed check and spit shine and shoes. It's not that. We actually have a lot of fun up here and we're also trying to get to, to the podium and wrestling. And that's huge. And you've seen that and you will see it as long as they continue to do that. You will see bigger recruits that were skittish about going to a service academy choose Army because whether it was something that was in their family long term or something that they want to do that maybe have not not done it because it's like we've actually had a kid that, that went to one of the service academies and was like, look, I didn't have enough time to to do wrestling. Like I felt like I didn't have enough time to do wrestling. And I think um I think as they tell that story and let people know that hey this this isn't just a a, a, a cookie cutter army service academy, like they're gonna get they're gonna get more and more recruits and they're gonna get better recruits. And it's all because they're giving people an inside look at what people think the academy's not and the video they put on twitter this morning is is getting retweeted and watched like crazy and i'm going to retweet as soon as i get off this phone and talk about how cool it is because they're thinking outside the box they're letting they again they found a problem and they're solving it through communication right they're letting people know that we 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 can we can still do all the stuff that you think that all these other colleges can do and we can't do and that's huge and, and think about it if they couldn't tweet out a video or they didn't want to take the time and it took some time to shoot this video it's produced it's chopped up and edited but again that goes to the forward thinking of, of coach ward and his staff to say hey we got to get over this hump we got to get past the stigma let's start communicating on their level and let's not only communicate on their level let's communicate through the channels that they communicate through let's put it on instagram let's put it on facebook let's put it on twitter let them look at it. Let them see it. And then I got kids coming in this weekend on a visit. Be like, dude, that video was so funny. I was a little, I was a little apprehensive about the service academy. I feel like I could go to school here now. You know what I'm saying? So like things like that are huge in our sport. But like you said, as the older guys start to, I don't want to say fade out. That sounds bad. Um, but as the older generation starts to retire, you're going to start seeing more. I hope. Let me say that. I hope you're going to start seeing more of this this innovation with our social media and with these marketing um, aspects of, uh, of what some of these programs are doing. One thing that we, we got into a discussion, not just on Twitter, but also we, we took it off to, uh, to text. And, and we were talking about the using the use of social media and marketing and branding with individual athletes. We touched on a little bit with David Taylor earlier, but uh, the, the flow wrestling, putting out the, the tweet from, from Jordan Oliver, uh, about wanting wanting a match with, with Zane Rutherford, and and what maybe was lost on that initially is, uh, you know, FRL Willie had, had said after the fact, it's like, yeah, this is the match we wanted for who's number one. Well, uh, you know, I'm looking at that, didn't know that that was a the match they wanted. I'm looking at it going, okay, and people, some people just lost their shit. Let's be honest with you. I mean, I I, yeah. I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, you know, I mean, I wasn't a huge fan of 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 how it was done. I don't have a problem with with a little, uh, you know, let's borrow a professional wrestling term, heat. I don't have a problem with legitimate heat. I just, you know, in some some situations, I looked at it and I thought it might have come off a little contrived. Uh, but when we talk about people when they they lost their minds on it, some of it is based on that. Again, it's the people that are on the social media, not you know, they don't maybe maybe there's a disconnect between the generations on. Well, I you know, like I'll be honest with you, I don't listen to Machine Gun Kelly. Wasn't really. I mean, I had to. I was like, uh, is that a leader? I didn't know. <laughs> Okay. Just uh, it was a death threat. No, just I knew it was wasn't a death threat. threat. I'm just like, that's not, <laughs> that's something different. And then, you know, within five seconds, somebody said it was a machine gun Kelly lyric. And, you know, I do have the new Eminem album. I think it's, it's, it's pretty good. So, but I, I don't know, you know, all the beef tracks. I have no idea half these people he's talking about. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm 39 years old now. I don't listen to, to hip hop. Like I did, you know, 
30 years ago. Well, not 30 years, 25 years ago. You That's know, your own fault. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, fault. There's, I got two. Year, two <laughs> I got a six year old and a two year old in, in the house. I can't run around throwing out some old school, you know, public enemy, you know, or, or, or you know, throw some easy right. out there. Can't quite do that with my kids any, anymore. So because uh, they, repeat, they repeat everything. But like so. The conflict that arises from people thinking that that's disrespectful. Part of us, yes, we do still have the old school fuddy duddy uh, type of mentality. It's like, oh, wrestling needs to be respected. I have no problem with personality. I have no problem with little gamesmanship. I have no problem with with poking the bear. Where there's there's some things that that we can borrow from MMA, and then there's some things that we we need to leave with MMA, like the circus show. That sometimes, yeah, Conor McGregor gets a lot of traffic, but I mean, come on. <laughs> some of those things that he does, I don't necessarily want in wrestling. So uh, this is where we may disagree on certain topics within this realm. But, you know, in terms of the marketing of the athlete using this to get a match, a call out, uh, where, where do you see this going? Where's your opinion on it? Um, you know, I, I thought about it that day and I was like, this topic is going to drive me to just start a podcast and I'm going <laughs> to. I, I, I know a guy who can facilitate that for you, by the way. I know, and I'm talking to you about it. I just, I just know it would be something that it would just, it, I would have so many ideas to do it, and it would end up taking too much of my time. And I, I want to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. So I'm going to wait till I, I got some time to actually dedicate to it and do it the right way. But as much as I had an opinion on it at the time, not to, not to kind of kill your point right now, but I, I don't know. Here's the deal. I never was a big Tony Ramos fan when he was in college. I might have actually even said that publicly on some Ropewell videos. And now me and Tony are, 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 are perfectly fine. I, I, I love the dude. I think he's going to do amazing stuff. No way. Sport. Tony Ramos. There's no way. Yeah. I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So, um, but part of it was just the stair thing. Like it just, I just didn't like it. I felt like it was an act. I, I, I didn't like it, but, but here was the deal looking back on it and like seeing, seeing and knowing him now and knowing him as an individual, and knowing he's, he's absolutely nothing like that. He's a pretty intense dude, but nothing like that. Um, and knowing that personality, what he did, um, a to prepare himself to think he was the baddest man in the planet, but also, um, a, a little bit of a, 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 a stigma about himself. I think there's tons of personality in our sport. I, I think you got guys like Mark Hall, who probably would be, and he's gotten he's gotten out of pocket, what, what we would consider out of pocket by Penn State standards, quite a few times. I love the hammer thing. He's flexed a couple times. He's done the little B-boy stance thing. I love that type of stuff. I don't think any of that stuff's in poor taste. Now, if he started, like, digging graves and dragging people in him like Tito Ortiz used to in the NCAA Finals, um, that would probably be a little overboard for amateur sports. Um, so when, when it comes to stuff like celebrating and having a little bit of person, not even a little bit, having a lot of personality about you, like I think a lot of people immediately take any type of celebration or any type of focus on me for a second. I just did something really cool as disrespectful in general to wrestling. And I remember, and I need to go find it because it's about the third person or fourth person I've mentioned it to. There was an interview with Matt Linlin a long time ago. I think Bader did. It was like at the Lions Pride MMA Academy or something way back in the day. And he was talking about the promotion of our sport, but he was also talking about how the stigma of nobody should be able to make money off wrestling. And if you make money off wrestling, you're a bad person, whether you have a business or whether you're trying to be a, a professional in our sport. And Ben was just a grumpy guy to be to, to begin with. But he actually, at the time, I was like, man, this guy's kind of out of his mind. But at the time, it didn't make sense to me. But the more I've been in the industry, it makes perfect sense to me. It's like a lot of people who look down on people for trying to market themselves and make money in the sport of wrestling, whether you're a professional athlete, whether you have a clothing company, whether you coach, a lot of people are still of that mantra of you be humble, you walk the line, you be thankful that, you, that wrestling happened to you. And you give every waking second of your free time that you can back to the sport of wrestling because you owe it to wrestling to do that. And at the end of the day, in my opinion, and a lot of people will be like, wow, I wouldn't expect you to say that. That's all garbage, in my opinion. That's just trash. Like, to me, to tell somebody they owe something to wrestling before they, before they, they make money off of it, 
doesn't wash in any other sport in the planet. I got there's a there's a baseball training facility right next door to me. There's plenty of MLB guys that do pitching and hitting lessons next door, and they're uber rich. And they're, and, and they're not and Tom and Mansky cars. either. Yeah, and <laughs> and, 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 and it, 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 it's uh, it's guys that just recently are out of the league, and they don't need the money, but they're coming over there and doing it. They're still charging kids a fair a fair price to be coached by a major league baseball player. You know what I'm saying? And like nobody's looking down on them, but but for some reason in our sport, again, we're we're still in that kind of. And I think as the older generation starts to to get to get um, out of the sport, and the newer generation starts to be more boots on the ground in the sport, which I think we're getting there with some younger head coaches and some younger guys in the media and guys like Sloan and, and things like that starting to be a little more edgy. And again, I never agree with everything Flow Wrestling does, but again, they, they push the envelope a little bit, but they open the door for guys like J.O. to be J.O. Um, J.O. being J.O. is not the same as Pat Downey being Pat Downey. Uh, we can all agree on that. But again, they're who they are, and ultimately they're going to end up based off the path that they blaze for themselves, don't blaze for themselves, or blaze too much for themselves, right? That's the way the real world works. So there's no reason why, for, and I'm not even touching on the, the Zane aspect of it, there's no reason why if J.O. plays by the rules, does, does what he's supposed to do, trains hard, competes hard, the J.O. can't get on social media and chirp it up and, and, and call some guys out. It's last time I checked, it's America, and he can say whatever he wants. Now, if he's on there every day, acting like Mike Tyson, talking about eating people's children or this, that, and the other, then ultimately nobody's going to want to associate with him because he's acting like a maniac, right? But again, when it comes to promoting oneself and promoting uh, your brand or your persona or your stigma or whatever you're doing in the sport, I, I really don't think that we should be drawing lines in the sand and limiting certain things. I, I think we should, I think we should just be okay with it and just be like, Hey, look, he wanted to, he wanted a match with Zane. Flo approached him and Zane about taking a match. J.O. decided to take it to a social media platform. I don't think it got out of pocket really much at all. Um, and, and it was probably the most talked about thing on social media for a couple of days. Um, and a lot of people were like, oh, Flo poked the bear and they did all that and they hit the state or they were trying to do this or that and the other. It was like, um, I, I don't see, I don't see the problem with 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 self promotion and 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 again and, and my tweet started off with you know if an MMA guy does it it's 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 business if a wrestling guy does it he's he's a thug or, or or whatever you know and a lot of people had some things to say about it and then Scott Green chimed in and was like we don't need heels to promote our sport and then it got completely away from what I was talking about which was um you know what we need in wrestling and how we need to market with our fan base and how we're going to go get a fan base outside of wrestling. And that, that wasn't my, that wasn't what I wanted to talk about at all. I mean, that's a totally different conversation about how we market to our fans and how we can gain fans outside of a regular market. And that's a, that's a, a long conversation. What I was talking about was J.O. didn't do anything wrong, in my opinion, chirping it up with Zane. And, Zane made his responses, and then J.O. kept going, and then Zane faded to black, and then it was a non-issue anymore. But again, you know, I still think that there's that 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 mindset of, you know, guys, we shouldn't do this. Everybody should get along, along and this, that, and the other, and and that's just not the world we're living in. Uh, J.O. is, believe it or not, J.O. is a super, super nice guy. He really is. He's an easygoing guy, and it's. It, I think a lot of people were thinking he's they had this picture in his head of he's standing outside of the subway waiting for Zane to walk out so he could like start a fight with him on the street type vibe. And it wasn't anything like that. It was, it was, Hey, let's, you know, let's, let's strap up the boots and, and go to work. You make, you make a good chunk of money. I make a good chunk of money. The event, we add value to the event. More people tune in for the event, add value to flow. Flow puts some money in our pockets. The fans are entertained. They got something to talk about on the on social media leading up to it. There's more content. There's more video clips we can chop up. There's more more stuff for you to talk about on your podcast. And you're not even you're not even in business with Flow Wrestling. There's more articles. Uh, you know, Intermat can write about what's going on with it. it. I mean, like, what what's the problem here? I don't understand what the problem with with Jo chirping a little bit to somebody on 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 social media 
was devastating. And like people talk about it, like it set our sport back or something like that. And I think that's the mindset that some people just need to get over. But do we need 35 JOs on Twitter every day? No, it would get annoying, right? And you see that in MMA. You see guys coming out like, right out of the blocks and want to make a name for themselves and they'll go call out somebody and they just get ignored and everybody makes fun of them. But this was relative. This was relative to the situation. And whether you like him or not, Shale Sonnen, even though he's wildly over the top a lot of times, talking about not up feeding a, a, a carrot to a bus, thinking it was a horse, like way back in the day, it's one of his epic interviews. But like he's gone over the top, but he's done a great job of keeping himself relative in an industry when he really competitively hadn't been relative in a while. And, and, and behind closed doors, he would probably admit that, that he's way past his prime, but he's created a new level of prime for himself by the way he market. And he has half a million podcast followers, which is, you know, is an industry that's making a lot of people a lot of money. And, you know, I, I don't, nobody's, nobody's trashing jail for, for being a, a, a little bit of a heel and a trash talker in, in MMA, but J.O. does the same thing, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the industry set back for a while. So, I, again, I think with anything, especially in our sport, we need to, we need to, we need to button our pants up and, and loose, you know, and, or, or loosen up our belt buckle a little bit and, and just, just relax and just enjoy it. And, and I, I think in the next five years, that'll get a little bit better as some of these media outlets are learning how to cover that a little bit more. Um, but there again, you've got some of these tra- traditional media outlets that aren't going to entertain giving that prime real estate in any, in any avenue. And right now it's kind of flow pushing it. And sometimes they can be a little TMZ-ish. Um, but again, they're, they're, they're doing a good job of putting stuff out there and what the response is and be like, ah, that might have been a bad idea. Let's not do that anymore. But they're testing the market. They're not doing the same thing they've always done. And that's what that's what media companies do. That's what industry does. I mean, even though ESPN's dying a slow death for a lot of reasons right now, they put out stuff in the past to be innovative and it's either worked or didn't work and they either continue to do it or they didn't. Like a pro athlete coming into the office. That's that's probably what ESPN is known more for than anything. And I guarantee you it was probably a conversation in a, in, in a, in a break room one day and somebody just kind of did it off the cuff and it ended up being something that defined, it, defined their, their media company from an advertising aspect. So um, we need to get out of our own way a little bit, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is Sports Center. You're right. I mean, even during, if you're watching them online, where they don't, you know, some, sometimes the, the commercial situations per, per each market, you won't see the progressive commercial here, you'll see it in a different market, and they'll like, okay, what do we got? We got, please stand by. Your event is a commercial breaker, and then they'll throw. This is a Sports Center commercial from 15 years ago with with Charlie right. Steiner going, "Follow me to freedom." With the Y2K, yeah. which is we're talking 18 years ago, and that joke, at least to those of us who were who were alive then, uh, you know, or, or aware of of what was going on then, it, it still you know it still plays. But when we look at, like I said, the one thing we we, we were discussing off was. I, I'm looking for genuine heat, I guess, and I'm not. I'm not trying to be a uh, kids get off my lawn. What would have helped is if I would have known there was a match beforehand, or that was what they were trying to get. Then my sure. my, my opinion might have been a little different. I think I was missing some key context there. So, to my well, defense, nobody ever nobody ever said Jo didn't go off the reservation too early, right? I mean, <laughs> it, 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 and again, and again. The standards in our industry, so if Dana White is getting together with Conor McGregor and Khabib seven months ago and say, hey, let's make this fight happen. We're going to sign the contract. The contract gets signed. There's already a plan in place, okay? So, like, guys, we're going to get these contracts signed tomorrow. We're immediately going to put out a huge social media blitz. There's already going to be promo videos chopped up, ready to go. You guys' press tour is going to be X, Y, and Z. This was more or less probably a, a text conversation. Now, Willie would never text anybody back. This was probably some That's type true. of conversation with, with somebody and J.O. about getting the match, and then J.O. got off the phone with them and immediately went to Twitter instead of like, hey, J.O., this is what we got. We got this idea. We're going to do X. Keep it under wraps for a minute, but we got a plan. Maybe even they say, hey, dude, we want you to call Zane Rutherford out and, and here's some ideas of what to say to do this, that, and the other. I mean, that's marketing. Who cares? But I think J.O. jumped the gun on it because he got excited about it. And that's what people were like, did he just randomly wake up and eat his Cheerios and call out Zane Rutherford or, or what's going on? And, and again, 
us starting to take, and that's what I talk about taking pieces from people like the UFC is a billion dollar industry. They're kind of doing okay in this media entertainment combat sports realm. Maybe we just peek over the fence and see what they're doing and steal a couple ideas from them instead of just saying, nope, we're wrestling. We don't do that. And those guys are savages and bloodthirsty capitalists. And we're staying as far away from that as we can. Well, last time I checked, that money talks. And, and that's, what, what, that's what's running our industry right now. I think, I, goodwill is not running the wrestling industry. You're not hiring. You're not renewing channels. Uh, um, Tony Roby just renewed his contract with Virginia Tech. Goodwill is not his form of payment, right? He gets paid uh, uh, a salary to coach a high-level wrestling team. So y'all can keep ignoring that there's money in our sport and money drives our sport and media drives our sport and entertainment drives our sport and attention grows our sport. And, you know, we can sit around and just be happy that the NCAA tournament's the biggest tournament of the year and everybody gets together once a year and then we go back to our respective lives and complain about wrestling not growing. Or, like I said, we can, we can loosen up the belt buckle a little bit and, and, and figure out ways to be a little bit more like some of these other major media and entertainment industries that are doing a pretty good job of uh, growing their audience. and and. I'm not a wrestling traditionalist. I'm not the guy that's going to sit there and be like, hey, man, well, the rules suck, and I'll never be able to convince my neighbor to watch this and this and this and this. But the guys that are saying that to me are just wasting a ton of time complaining about something instead of being the solution to something. And uh, the, the more people that just kind of get over that and just trying to start doing a little bit more to support some of this stuff or a little bit more to, to think outside the box, whether it's a guy like you or Flo Wrestling or just some Joe Blow down the street that decides to start doing. I mean, look at all these other podcasts that have popped up. Like, I mean, like you got, you got, you got, what was it? Blood Round and Inner Circle. Like you got all these podcasts that pop up. You got uh, the PA Power one. Like none of these podcasts existed before you were, you, you were hammering away, Right. And I'm not saying you've inspired all these guys to do this, but but you prove that it, you can do it. And it's not like you're, you know, you're you're working a, a midnight job and, and killing yourself 14 hours and then you're coming home and ripping off a bunch of podcasts. This is what you do for a living. You've proven to people that you can have a podcast and be a, a journalist and cover the sport of wrestling and make a living off of it, which other people are going to be like, you know what? I can't quite do that yet. But I'm going to start in my in my in my basement or in my closet, and I'm going to grow to that level. And guess what that does? That pulls those very very local fans that those guys had. That when those guys start growing to a regional level and then a national level, like you have, the people that followed you from day one that were right down the street, you're are, are still following you. But the guys in California that ran into you at, at a tournament or heard your voice on the World Championships or something, or a fan of you now, and you've grown nationally. Like you've helped grow the base, right? And then those fringe people start coming in. But when there's all this chaos and 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 confusion and, and and all that within the marketing of our sport right now and the way we're growing it, that 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 kind of tends to the people that are right inside the fringe and right outside the fringe just say, you know what, all that white noise I don't need. I'm just gonna turn it off. And I'm not just gonna I'm not gonna listen to anything and I'm gonna book my hotels for March. And I'm going to geek out with my, my old college roommate. And then I'm going back to no man's land after that, you know, and, and I look at it this way for, and I'm not saying our target market is the NCAA tournament, but there are a lot of people that do that. They're very, very fair weather type wrestling people, but they're wrestling people. And we could draw those people back into their sport. There's a lot of one and done wrestling fans around the country that, that we could get back as regular fans of the sport and then those fringe guys, we start bringing them into just on pure, it, just pure excitement value of it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the issue is with a lot of people just being so stubborn on that. Um, I think it's a lot of people telling them that as they're growing up. And like I said, until I started running a business in wrestling, I kind of had that mindset when me and Roper sat down to open the gym. I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be okay taking money from kids to run a practice. Like, I've been doing it for free since I got out of high school. Like I, I had like a conflict. I, 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 I'm almost like want to go back in time and like punch myself as hard as I can in the face, you know, that I had those <laughs> thoughts. But, uh, um, you know, it's, it, it's not, 
and I, I probably am going to come off in this as having a negative mindset about the state of affairs of, of wrestling right now. And I, I think that we are at a point with not only society in general, with the internet and, and technology and everything, I think we're at a point in wrestling where wrestling literally could explode and be covered and marketed and have the most exciting times ever in the history of our sport as we want them to. We just got to want them to. And I think there's still people that for some reason don't want them to. I think it's the scaredness or the being afraid of the unknown. And I think that unknown is this social media, internet, personality, growth, personal brand kind of glob sitting out there in front of them. And they would rather ignore it until they're kind of through the sport than just kind of peek around the corner, look over the fence and embrace and I think once everybody starts doing that, you're going to see a big jump in growth. You're going to see a huge jump in growth. And then as <clears throat> technology progresses with that growth, I think we're going to see something special in the next 10 years. I think wrestling is going to be in a completely different state in 10 years. I think you're going to start seeing a lot more Division One programs added. I think you're going to see, see a lot more coverage of our sport, a lot more media um, start to pop up because it's going to be a viable revenue source. It's going to be something that people want to be a part of and cover. Um, not just from a money standpoint, um, but from a, a valuable media standpoint. Like that media that you put out covering our sport is valuable. Um, and, and who knows? There's podcasts scooped up every day by major organizations that need content for their platform. And I think as, as sports podcast networks like the one you have, um, you might be buying uh, podcast networks five, six years from now. You never know. I mean, you might be like, look, we want to be the biggest wrestling podcast network in the planet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to grow my network. I'm going to continue to grow my personal brand, but the end game for Jason Bryant, so I can be a professional wrestling fan and only cover wrestling when I want to, because that's what I really want to do is be a professional wrestling fan. That's my goal with all that's my, that's my end game. I'm a professional wrestling fan. I want to be able to hop on the plane, be going to world championships. And that's what I do. And if I cover the sport on my own social media or whatever, you're getting a look inside me doing it. But that's what—that's my end game. That's why I work so hard. Be a professional wrestler, and I'll coach forever. But but think about that. If that was your end game, and as these other podcast networks grew, you started buying them and making them part of your network, and then you had all these ears and all these eyes and all of these fans that maybe listen to one podcast because they like that personality. Now you're starting to build it like old school radio, right? You're starting to build like radio's obsolete as it can be. The reason why podcasts are awesome because it's on demand. I can listen to it when I want to, right? And then I don't have to get up and be on the road commuting to work at 7 a.m. To, to listen to The Breakfast Club. I can, I, can include, I can turn on Jason Bryant while I'm eating my sandwich at my desk at lunch and listen to it. But if you built this giant podcast network of just wrestling and you were the network to go to now you have way more value you can add from that guy that wanted to stroke you a thousand dollar check a month you're like look dude we got the biggest wrestling network in the planet we have we have over a half a million maybe chael did a half a million by himself but you build a network that has a half a million and it's 15 different podcast networks now you got negotiability right you can go negotiate with these guys you can demand what you were talking about, what's tough to demand. And be like, look, the, the, the numbers don't lie. You know what I'm saying? These are, these, are, these are guys that are tuning in on a regular basis, these subscribers, right? And then, then, then your value's there. So I think, I think we're, we're, we're at the gate of an extremely exciting time, not for industry in general as far as technology goes, but as far as our sport. Um, we get out of our own way, man. We're going to be in good shape. Last thing I want to touch on, and this still goes back with the – the MMA, and by the way, a lot of those things you're talking about as far as the podcast network, uh, maybe not buying, but right now we got uh, 18 active shows, 19 active shows. We've had as many as 25, so I think I got the biggest Love wrestling it. podcast network thing taken care of. But uh, now, Love it. working on the growth. Now, the one thing sure. I like to take from MMA that we need to do, I feel we need to do a better job, is is these live events. Is is the events? Uh, you know, we had. Three really unique events called Final X. A couple years ago in Omaha, we had a similar style of event. It was a dual meet with you know some individual. It was actually a dual meet. It was matchups. It was called the Victory Wrestling Challenge. Ryan Stoddart, who was out there, does the Victory Fighting Championships out there, and it was a MMA style event, but with wrestling and walkouts. You had music, just like kind of like you did in Final X, but also around the mat, you did have the VIP seating. But 
What did you have at the VIP seating? You had, get this, I, I, you, you had beverages, adult beverages. You had, you know, a, a, an event. You know, I was at an LFA event here in Minneapolis probably two, three months ago. And it was relatively, the fights that night on the card were relatively mediocre. It was a mediocre MMA card, even though LFA is a good a good organization. I don't want to trash them by any means. But, the, the, right. the, you know, it, it left a little bit to be desired. If you're only used to watching Bellator or the UFC, you're, you're not going to see that level uh, of athlete. You're going to see some of the flabbier guys. You're going to see some, so, some you know, just turned pro. They're, they haven't been there. They're, they're building their way up. There's bottle service, Cliff. There's bottle service at Bad Fight. I was in Virginia watching Corey Ace and my old roommate Joe Wright fight with some organization in Virginia. They had folding tables and their VIP seats with with beverages. And I was like, are you kidding me? People are paying a premium price just so they can sit down and have a beer while watching the fights. So or what? Yeah. So taking that for wrestling, I mean, we could. What, what's what's the problem of barring that type of thing? From MMA, let, let, at Final X, let's, let's see if it's not on a campus. We find a small venue, say, like, let's use the Roy Wilkins Auditorium in Minneapolis or St. Paul for as an example. That's a 5,000-seat arena. You put, some, you put some bottle service down there. You got waitresses. You got beer. You got an event for your big wigs. You can entertain. You bring people in. Hey, I've got a table. Come watch these, the, this two-hour event. I want to see more of that. I want to see more of value for that. That's where you bring in the big money people is you give them something. You don't sit in the stands with them or, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm Matt side. Well, what are you doing with that Matt side seat? You're sitting there watching wrestling. You, you, you know, how many MMA fights are people sitting there? They're actually watching the matches they want to uh, watch. And then, okay, oh, wait, well, Mallory Martin's coming up. Oh, we're here to watch her. And then, you know, the rest of it's a social hour. What's wrong with that? Um, I – and this is just me shooting from the hip. Um, I, I would say a, a couple things. So, and, and, and this is what I noticed, and it, it still blows my absolute mind to this day, and you see it. I mean, you're busy on press row, and somehow I managed to get on press row every year, which should be a felony. Um, but you'll see fans. So, so you're probably, what, quarterfinal consos, and you'll see fans leaving when the quarterfinal consos start. You're talking about guys that, predicted to be all Americans wrestling in their console quarters or something like that. And people are leaving to go to the local drinking hole or go get something to eat or something like that. It's a tension, right? It's a tension. And, and, and the, the, the issue that I think we struggle with as a sport of wrestling is the event from a tournament perspective is so long. So like for a casual fan, right. I'm, I'm talking, I'm not talking about the, 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 the three day, the, the two day, big 10. No, 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 let me, let me, I, I'm, I'm leading into it. I'm okay. leading into it. Just, I'm leading into it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just building, building the framework for you here. So it's even long for a diehard fan that came from Wisconsin to New York to watch the NCAA tournament. I think what's beautiful about fights or fight cards is it's a couple hours right? At the max, it's two and a half, maybe three hours. You're talking about a long production undercard, everything if it showed up when the doors open and stayed till they put the strap around the guy that won the main event. Now, in between that, you mentioned alcohol. You mentioned things that kind of loosen up the environment, and they're not just sitting there in a chair over and over and over watching the guys walk in the room, punch each other in the face and leave, or walk to the mat, do some wrestling moves, and then walk off. What that does is, is the, the short time span plus the experience that's created with the walkout music and the, and the, and the dry eyes, smoke and the lights and all that stuff, is that it creates a little bit of an experience, but it also creates a little bit of a social setting as well. Um, and I think that is where you could bring a buddy that's not a huge wrestling fan, but you could bring them, you know, to have a couple beers, sit ringside, watch a two-hour show. These guys are high-level athletes. They're competing. This, that, and the other, and it's not it's not painful as hey, let's go to the NCAA tournament and sit here for ten straight hours or eight straight hours and 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 grind through a tournament. Um, and 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 I think dual meets are cool, but the problem with dual meets is it's not a marquee matchup for ten weights, right, or fourteen weights. So the people that are there either are diehard wrestling fans or have a vested interest in a couple guys at a couple weights, right? They're either a uh, got a kid on the team and they love every kid on the team or they're an uncle of a kid and they're only coming to see that one weight class. I, I think that we, we have to, and that's why I was talking about those fringe guys is these fights are a abbreviated kind of uh, social event 
And I don't know how much alcohol plays a role in that. I'm sure there's some uh, professor that, that could clue me in on, you know, on, on the uh, social effects if alcohol is involved or not involved. Um, and it always seems to loosen things up. Uh, but I don't know if that takes a fringe fan that never really liked to go to a wrestling event. And now that all of a sudden I can sell alcohol and they can drink uh, Matt side and they're going to come. I could be completely wrong about that. But I know the experience. And, and it being brief, and when I say brief, a couple hours tops, helps out a lot. And, but the problem is with an event you're talking about, what have we had? How many, how many pro leagues have we had? Uh, I mean, we had, we've had uh, you know, going back to the 70s, so you can go back through the amateur wrestling news. I remember flipping through, I think it was the, the late 70s, early 80s. It says, you know, uh, PW, uh, Professional Wrestling League, looking to start. And I remember people throwing out names like, Gene. I'm looking through this in Gene Mills and stuff like that. These pro right. wrestling concepts have been around for decades. Uh, we had RPW, right. well, what, 2002, 2000, you know, season two was supposed well, to be 2003. That, and what was that? That was a super rich dude that wanted to create it to sell it to a network, right? From what I understood. And it was Am on PAX. Remember what PAX was? Nobody watched PAX. Right. Right, it was like Channel 69, then, then went to PAX. You know what like else was on like, PAX? Seventh Heaven or whatever the hell that show was. That was on PAX. <laughs> well, so here's my deal. That guy had a plan. He was going to create this pro wrestling league. I don't even know if he was a pro, if he was a real wrestling, big time wrestling fan or not. But I, the story I heard is he had a lot of money, he created this pro wrestling league. He did a pretty good job of building a, an entire arena and creating an environment. Whether they bust the people in and paid them in free food vouchers to cheer when guys did something or whether those were diehard wrestling fans. And then I guess his ranch burned down and half the videos burnt with it or whatever. Yeah, and that, like, and that guy's, interest in it. yeah, that guy's had a few more legal problems along the way. And, uh, <laughs> you, you can Google no. that. I don't want to get into what, uh, what right. that, yeah, but, um, but yeah, but, but that was part like, of it. Cause I remember writing some stuff for them early my, on, but here's uh, my deal. I, Creating a pro wrestling league in wrestling is about as difficult, and, and I'm not saying it is difficult, but it's proved to be as difficult as being the next company that creates a wrestling shoe for wrestling. Everybody's failed, and they failed miserably. And again, I'll bring up Rudis. I hope they succeed. I hope they kill it with the shoe. Doesn't affect, doesn't affect me one way or the other. I love to see progress and people progress in a space that I'm a part of. So if they can knock it out of the park with the shoe and be a major player in that game, I love it. I love the progression in our sport. But coming back to the event is nobody has ever done it, and the people that have tried to do it have been people that really have no vested interest. Now we got the American Wrestling League, and from what I understand about that, you clarify, it is Wayne Boyd playing with Andy Barth's money trying to create a wrestling league. Andy Barth has already written off X amount of dollars to Wayne Boyd that he never expects a return on. Right. So if it fails, nobody cares. It's a write off. That's part of the problem in wrestling is when people are donating money for a cause, it's a write off to them. There's no vested interest. Now, there might be some pride on the line if it fails. But if I came to you tomorrow and said, hey, JP, I'm starting a pro wrestling league. I'm taking every ounce of money that I've ever made in the sport of wrestling, my clothing company. I'm, I'm liquidating everything. I'm going to sell it for millions of dollars. I'm going to, I'm going to see all those millions of dollars back into this pro wrestling league. You're going to be the voice of my pro wrestling league, and these are the guys I'm going to go get and be in my league, and we're going to do four events a year, and I expect to make this amount of money, and I get these sponsors lined up. How much effort do you think I'm going to put into making that thing work? Uh, a lot more. A ton more, and that's been the problem with it. And, and, and only, not only on top of that, I think that most of them have been poorly executed. I mean, Prowl looked like it was going to be the real deal, and it ended up being just a Twitter account. Like, I didn't even know what happened after that. Like, I was halfway excited because Nova Grass seems like he's got his head wrapped around some of this stuff pretty well, and, like, it just never went anywhere. I don't know if they're waiting on something or what, but, again, all of these things that I remember, and I know Tate Moore tried to start one, um, and then he had a couple events. But again, it's usually been off the start of somebody that just gave somebody some money because they want to help wrestling. Wrestling doesn't need a handout. Wrestling needs vested interest in the things we're trying to get into. And until we get out of this charity thing of 
somebody gave me a million dollars to go start a pro wrestling league, but he doesn't care if it really takes off or not. And I got no repercussions for it. I still get to drive my car and, and sleep in my bed and everything. If it fails miserably, then those things are going to continue to fail over and over again and have lack of resources and have lack of vested interest because it's a handout. Right. So no, no, there's going to be no strikes against Wayne Boyd. And I don't know Wayne Boyd at all. There's going to be no strikes against Wayne Boyd if this thing flops miserably. And the thing about it is, is more and more athletes, if you talk to them, are starting to get more and more put off by these things popping up and they commit to them and then use their image to promote them. I mean, just imagine if, if, if somebody started an all-star basketball league and got LeBron and, and some of these other and, and Steph and some of these other guys that say, yes, I'm in, and then five times, five different organizations fell flat on their face. You think the fifth time when somebody would call LeBron, he's going to be like, yeah, man. He's going to be like, no, dude, I got way more important things to do. I still have world, David Taylor still has world teams to make, you know, and he wants this stuff to grow, but that's that thing in the back of his head saying, hey, you owe it to wrestling to grow wrestling, right? And I'm not saying he should tell them to piss off. What I'm saying is until somebody is involved, on a level that they have an extremely vested interest in making something work soup to nuts, and it's not just kind of a hobby that they're doing, all of those things will continue to fail, whether it's a starting a wrestling shoe or starting a pro league or any of that stuff. That's the way the world works, man. If there's no repercussions for, for me going to rob in a bank right now, man, I would love to have a bunch of money. I'm going to go rob a bank, right? So, like, at the simplest form, I think that's where we've been with the pro wrestling league. Man, and I would, I would love for, you know, uh, somebody to have the money, have a vested interest, and then build a team of people and be like, look, marketing and media is going to be the number one thing that makes this thing grow, take off, or sink. So priority number one, before we even get athletes, we need to build a team of one, 25, 3,000 people that is going to make sure that this thing is built right, the brand's grown right. And we might, like I, like I said, again, preload it. Crowd was preloading the hype. Crowd was announcing all these people being a part of it. They were announcing all this stuff. I was, I normally kind of ignore that stuff until I like see something in action, like I see some progress. And I was getting fired up about it, A, because of the people that were involved in it. But you create that hype, you get some brand loyalty, you get some eyes on what you're doing, and you actually pull the trigger and execute, even if it sucks. Even if it terrible, terrible product, you go back and improve it. You go back and and you figure out what went wrong. You listen to the fans. You adjust your media. You adjust your rosters. You adjust the experience. And then you continue to grow from that. Everything's been kind of one and done, right? Everything's been kind of one and pretty done. If you would have sat down, recorded a podcast, your first podcast, put it out there, and thought you were going to get 100 likes and 3,000 views, and you got five likes, and 200 views, and you're like, you know what? I'm going back to the nine to five. I'm just going to call the local newspaper and go get a job. Like that, that, that's basically what's happened with every pro league. Nobody's tried to stick it out and say, look, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to make it happen. We have a plan, and we have a budget, and we have a team that we're going to do this committed for a year or seven events or two or whatever, enough amount of events to, to vet it or not bet it, or adjust it and grow it and 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 uh, refine it. It, it, it. That's like we keep coming to wrestling practice for one day and they'd be like, hey, you're not going to be a state champ, dude. You didn't hit your drop step right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, why do we keep getting into that with these pro wrestling leagues? And I hope they pan out. But, man, it just it just hasn't been a model that I've looked at and been like, you know what, they got the right people involved. There's a vested interest. This could possibly work because the athletes keep jumping on board. They have everybody who's who in the in wrestling that's going to come to this American Wrestling League. But again, if it's executed poorly, these athletes aren't going to waste their time. They're not going to waste their effort on social media to grow something that's going to be a one and done. You know, and that's you know that's where you know I I, I don't get irritated. I just kind of look at it and be like, wow, like it's the guy that bought the restaurant that failed because it was in the wrong spot of town and nobody went to, and then he buys it and opens the exact same restaurant and thinks he's going to do it different. You know what I'm saying? So, like, 
why aren't we making adjustments here? It seems like it's the same song, 90 second verse. And I know I'd probably sound real arrogant right now talking about it, but like, that's the facts, right? Am I wrong? Those are the facts. I mean, am I wrong? I mean, I, I'm not crapping on anybody for trying. I'm not. I'm really not because I, I really wanted to get behind Teague a little bit on it. I just financially at the time, it just I just couldn't make it happen because I really felt like he he probably was the most vested guy that's come around um, that wanted to make it work. But, I mean, he's a head coach. He's doing this. He's doing this. So, like, I don't, I don't know, you know, how much he, he had time to put into it to make it work on the level it, it needed to be. But, you know, again, you know, it, it, maybe it's just one of those things that just – we got to agree that's not going to work. I, I'm not a guy that ever believes that anything's impossible, especially when it comes to something like that. When you get that many people in one building for one event a year at NCA, but look at the Indian. Look at that. Is that the Bundesliga, right? The Indian League. Uh, India's the 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 PWL. Germany has the Bundesliga, and that's so, actually interesting. The German league is it's weird because they they are allowed a certain amount of international wrestlers per team, and then halfway through the season. They switch styles, so you're wrestling both styles throughout the court, and they're not in ten thousand seat arenas. They're in, you know, two thousand, three thousand, maybe. You know, there might be even some small halls in these little leagues that are that are five hundred. They get packed, they get crazy, they get loud, and uh, they're they're having their Who big styles. Who cares? Who cares? It's an environment. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the thing. Is like when I was fighting MMA early, early, early two thousands. Like it was in a middle school gym. And I'm pretty sure the ring doctor was a veterinarian. You know what I'm saying? Well, you guys were animals. Oh, dad jokes. Good job. Good job. Look at where it's at now. And I'm not saying if I would have started later, I would be in one of these major shows. I I wouldn't have been. But again, like, we want this. We want to launch a pro league and it to be the NCAA tournament on the second event. Like, there's no patience involved in it. There's no patience involved. And I think part of it's no patience. No vested interest. And I think if you get some patience, vested interest, and a solid blueprint, I think it can happen. I, again, look at a guy like Frank Papalizio, who's like, nobody will come in the middle of nowhere in New York to come to a preseason tournament when people can drive to a much easier location on the Eastern Seaboard and Super 32 two weeks later. What am I doing this weekend? I'm spending a big chunk of money to take a bunch of my hammers up to his event because it's worth me going to, because my kids are going to rest some of the best kids in the country. I know the experience is going to be unbelievable. There's going to be a ton of college coaches there to look at my kids and I can walk around and, and talk to these college coaches about my athletes. So it's an, it's an environment that it gives me a lot of angles to do a lot of things that are good for my business and good for my kids and good for my club. And Frank has worked tirelessly to create that. And it's like I said, from the jump, he added tons of value to every aspect of that event. And that's why people go. That's why I'm, I'll spend more money taking nine kids to journeyman this weekend than I will spend taking 60 kids to super 32 in three weeks. But again, it's value. And until we understand that we got to add value to whatever we're asking for, whether I'm asking for attention or asking for sponsorship or asking for anything until we add value, man, it's going to be tough to grow anything. It's going to be tough to grow any business in any industry. And we are operating in a vacuum because wrestling's a little when it comes to business already. So you're, you're, you, you, got, you got even bigger challenges. So, I mean, I kind of got off on a tangent, and I don't even know if I, uh, if I uh, piss a lot of people off or not. But, I mean, that, that's, just, that's just my take on it. And you know, if somebody gave me a bunch of money tomorrow or I liquidated everything tomorrow, would I be confident that I could make a pro wrestling league happen? Um, yeah. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I could. And, and if it didn't, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old. I got, I got plenty of more time to go do other stuff. So I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be the end of the world. So, I mean, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I, I feel like I got 40 more years to, to make a bunch of cool stuff happen in, in, in the industry. So, um, but until that person comes along, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's going to, ha- I don't think it's going to happen, man. I really don't. I mean, that's just my unprofessional opinion. <laughs> unprofessional enough. You can uh, see what he's doing as far as his own social media aspects at Narkill. That's K and well, yeah, with K N A R K I L L and at CMP clothing, Cliff Fretwell, always bring bring us a marathon episode, man. So uh, <laughs> we're, uh, we're not going to two part this. Man, this I'm is short on words. 
Yeah, you know, like you said, one of our first interviews, man, I'm smarter than I sound, and uh, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll we'll go with that. <laughs> Cliff, always a pleasure, man. Appreciate the support and uh, everything. We'll see you down the line. Love you, brother. Take care, man. That's really all I got time for you today. I mean, that was a marathon there with Cliff Fretwell. Again, thanks to Compound, cmptwear.com, Compound Clothing, all over the web for their support of this program, at least with the, with the gear. And if you're a patron of this program, you're going to get some of that cool Compound gear here in the next couple of weeks. Just got to make sure I can uh, make sure. Got to make sure I can get up and uh, mail all the stuff. Prepping for the World Championship says uh, we recorded this prior to the UFC fight. So our comments about the UFC, that would be uh, a little interesting to look to in hindsight. Now, oh, man, 900 names to get through for the 96 countries set to go to the World Championship. So we're going to probably put short time into a little bit of a park for a minute. I'm trying to get a hold of Terry Steiner and Bill Zadick to get some uh, women and men's freestyle previews down the line. Maybe we'll have Rich, Richard Immel come in and pinch hit as both coaches are looking to uh, to head across the big pond. Matt Lindland is already there, so we got him talking Greco. But uh, we'll figure something out heading into the World Championships. Of course, this is enough of an episode with Cliff Fretwell to uh, just wet your whistle for, for quite a while. And again, if you, if you like the program, you like what we do here, it is a fan-supported show, mattalkonline.com slash join the team, patreon.com slash mattalkonline. You know, as my friends at Grumpy Old Geeks say, you know, a buck, five bucks, ten bucks a month, whichever you prefer, you want to throw it in my direction, I will be forever thankful, and you will get thanked on this show and get some cool stuff at it. As always, I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me, and today a lot of time with me and Cliff Fretwell, because you've always got time for short time. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Clothing. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. First time listening? Well, you can change that by going to matttalkonline.com slash get short time to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or listen on your favorite podcatcher at matttalkonline.com slash listen. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com. In the finals.